Okay, so it's that time. Um, welcome. <laughs> I figured it'd be kind of a slow afternoon because that's usually the way it is, right? Um, late in the day, it's kind of hard for folks. So this is all going to be on a bit.ly link. If you want to be able to get back to anything, it's up there. And I'll go back to it at the end too, just in case. But uh, what I did a session last year that was like one of those 10 minute lightning things um, on accessibility tools. And afterwards, Tim said, you need to do a whole session on that. And so I said, OK, I'll do that next year. Um, and, and so that, that, is, that is why I'm doing this. And what's what all this is about. Um, I work at the University of Idaho, and I'm the director of the Doceo Center. So the Doceo Center supports technology and integration in K-12 classrooms, but also with faculty on campus. And I feel like a big role of me incorporating technology is showing people what technology can do to help them meet um, universal design for learning. Okay, so I always try to think of things through universal design for learning when I'm looking at different technologies and thinking, who, who is this right for? Um, the other thing that I find is that it's really hard to find a technology that doesn't fit one of these, quite frankly. Okay, there's just so many crossovers. Um, and I also kind of look at it where, you know, a lot of times when you start talking about universal design for learning, somebody will think, oh, well, that's about you know, students who have disabilities. It's totally not. Um, that's everybody. And so a lot of the accessibility tools I'm going to show you today are from the perspective of, these just make our life easier. Why aren't we using them? Okay? And a lot of, the answer to a lot of that is a lot of people just don't know they exist. <laughs> okay? Um, so my challenge in doing this uh, with faculty is always to get them past the idea that an accessibility tool is a crutch. It's not. It's just a way of getting somewhere. Um, I also try to explain to them the definition of accessibility that I look at accessibility in terms of being able to be easily obtained or used, period. Okay. And, and again, it doesn't matter who we're talking about. I, I think that accessibility then has the potential, these tools have the potential to increase productivity, which I think is extremely important for us as faculty and for all of our students, and to help students and faculty do, be more independent in their learning and teaching. So the first thing is a lot of people don't realize the accessibility tools that are built into the very device that they use daily, okay? Um, a lot of times when I know a student could be helped from it, I'll, in my classroom, take 10 minutes and say, hey, are you using this stuff? And I'll just show them, right? Show them the menu. This is what it looks like in your accessibility tools. Um, I can't pull that up on this computer because I don't have access. <laughs> but uh, if you go to your device and you go to settings, you're going to find a menu that's all about accessibility. So some of the things that I see lots of people use just because it's helpful is um, uh, probably number one is increasing the size of your mouse cursor. I mean, mouse cursors are tiny. <laughs> and a lot of times as we get older and start to squint at stuff as we're, you know, pulling it away from our faces, it's kind of hard to track that all the time. So just something that simple, increasing your mouse cursor can be huge. Um, I, I show a lot of faculty that because I see them struggling with that. And I'm just, you know, why don't you do this? <laughs> it takes two seconds. It's done. The other thing you can do usually is highlight your mouse cursor so that you can see where it's going around the page because it's got a yellow circle around it. Okay, so those are very popular things. Um, a third one that I see a lot of people use on devices is a dark background. Instead of having the white background on everything, it, it tends to be a little easier on your eyes when you're working on a computer lots. Chrome extensions, I think, are where I probably use the most accessibility tools. And I'm actually going to dig into these and show you how a few of them work, just so you get a feel. How many use Chrome extensions already? Yay! Okay. Um, Chrome extensions, I think, are priceless. And these are some of my favorites, and that's because I look at it from that accessibility um, 
perspective, and these are ones that I show all of my students. If my students take an online course, they have this little thing that says um, uh, tech tools for your use, and it goes over these and just gives them a quick caption of what each one can do for them, right? Don't have to use it, but if you wanna use it, if they're in my class, I'm probably gonna spend uh, 15 minutes walking through these and saying, you know, you could be using these things and here's what they do. So uh, select and speak, I'm just gonna go out for these because I have to pull up something. Let's go to NPR and hope I don't find anything truly offensive, but. Let's see. Usually if you scan way down to the bottom of the page, you can get past all the... Here we go. NASA's first all-female spacewalk set for Friday. A happy news. There we go. <laughs> it's really hard to find happy news right now. So I'm like, oh! Uh. <laughs> yeah. So um, Chrome extensions as you know live to the right of your browser up there so the ones i'm going to show you are up there and i thought i'll just pull up an npr article to kind of give you an idea of how these work and so the first one is um called select and speak select and speak by the way when i turn it on hopefully there are play live radio space Oh, it's, it's, it's going to something different. So let me highlight it. There we go. So select and speak, you basically select the piece of text you want read to you and push play and it reads it to you. The nice thing about showing it to students on Chrome is that it lives with them whenever they're logged into their Chrome account. It doesn't matter what device they're on. So that's the really nice piece of it. Um, I have a lot of students that really depend on stuff like this. Now, I could go in and change the voice. I can change it to a male schedule. voice. I can also change NASA's the speed of the voice. For the free Friday. one, I have little... Um, NASA announced the scheduling. Here, wait. There we go. I have little flexibility beyond that. But anytime you want to mess with a Chrome extension, you just right click on it. And there's usually an options menu. Um, that's also how you remove it. If you put one on and then you decide, I'm never going to use that. You can go there to delete it as well. Just right click on it. Um, so the free one lets you go to settings. And you can see here, I can change it to mail. And I can speed it up. Usually if you speed it up a little bit more, it sounds a little more normal. When they're too slow, they're just, you know. Um, I also have a lot of students who want to read stuff at a faster speed who will use it merely because they're not fast readers. And they can understand things at a faster speed, but letting it read them, read it to them helps them a good deal. <laughs> okay, so that's how that one works. Um, one of my favorites is Mercury Reader. So if I click on Mercury Reader here, there we go. So it took the article and it took all the busyness away from it. So now, as a student, I don't have any links to go to. I don't have anything to distract me. And websites, when you're doing research, are very good at that. The other thing I love about this is then I can send it directly to my Kindle and read it later, <laughs> okay? So you can kind of save these in an alternative way and have them for later. So when, I, when students do research, I say, why don't you try this? Because instead of saving the website URL, this is, you're just getting the text. You're getting everything you need right here. Um, the other thing you can do here is if you go up to the right-hand corner, there is a little tool toggle. And if you go into that, you can change it to dark mode. Uh, you can change the font a little bit, and you can also enlarge it if you need to. Okay, so those little settings are huge for students. That's probably my favorite. So I'm going to turn that one back off, go back to the normal article. There we go. And the third one I want to show you is reading roller. So when students are reading, it's sometimes hard to stay on track, especially if you're reading on a device. You can kind of lose your track. It's not like reading on paper, right? And most of the time now we're reading on devices. So if you do, 
the reading roller, you can change your color. So if you don't like yellow, you know, you can switch to green or switch to pink or whatever color you like. You can change the opacity as well, whatever you want to do there. And then um, the way it works is you come over here and double click on a line. And so that line is highlighted. And as I'm reading, I can just use my down arrow and move down the page. So it's so much easier to focus on that green going across and I don't lose traction and I'm actually able to read things faster. Okay, so that is another huge one that I would say my students really sort of latch on to and, okay, why didn't I know about this four years ago, right? That kind of thing. Yeah? Are you able to use Mercury Reader and Reading Roller at the same time? Good question. You aren't, actually. Um, and I always say that and I'm like, oh, if you could only use them at the same time. Um, there's another one, for example, Dyslexia Unscrambled. Um, there are tons of students that sit in your classroom that have dyslexia. And some of them don't even know it, but the ones who do know it have learned how to deal with it in their own little way. But um, if you go out to the Chrome Web Store, and by the way, all these little pictures have are clickable so that you can go to the links related to them. Um, if you go out to the Chrome Web Store and type in dyslexia, you could get one that's called Dyslexia Unscrambled. It's one of my favorites. And um, I wish you could use it at the same time as Mercury Reader, <laughs> right? Because I want them to be able to both, uh, but, but because it's an extension, extensions don't work together, if that makes sense. So um, I should have put that one on here, but I'll do it real quick. Here's what Dyslexia Unscrambled does. So there is a font for people who are dyslexic that is the easiest for them to read. And what Dyslexia Unscrambled does is changes to that font automatically. All you do is click the button and the entire web page is now displayed in that font. Um, so when they're, again, using Chrome, it, it's perfect for that. So if I go back over here, where did my, I think I got rid of my NPR News. Where did I do? Oh yeah, control shift. I always forget that on it. There it goes. Okay. Thank you. So here's my dyslexia unscrambled up in the corner. And if I click on it now, it's in the new font. Okay, so simple as that. What is that font? Um I don't remember the name of it. It's it basically it, it not only changes the font, but it's also spaced differently so that students can, yeah, so the, the, the letters don't blend together for them as easily, okay. yeah. So they've done lots of research on it, and apparently that is the best look of font in order to be able to read if you have um, dyslexia. So that is another favorite of mine. Uh, the other ones I have linked down here, I won't show you every single one of them and how they work, but Grammarly, priceless for students. Uh, they need that. I need that, quite frankly. Uh, <laughs> so I use Grammarly. Uh, Google Dictionary is another one. Google Dictionary, if you double click any word on a page that you are reading, it will bring up the um, definition. It also gives you a pronunciation for the word. Okay, so that one uh, gets a lot of use. Um, read and write for Google is another one, and what Read and Write for Google allows you to do is annotate on the page so that you can highlight a web page that you're looking at. You can highlight the things that are important, you can take notes. So it lets you do um, sort of some higher level thing. And then I also show students uh, this, day focused. How many of my students, if I ask them this question, I, I often will, will ask them, you know, how. How often do you get distracted and go to other websites or check your email or check this or check that while you're doing research or while you're writing a paper? It's pretty constant, right? <laughs> I mean, we do it all the time. Uh, if you uh, add stay focused, you can block content for certain amounts of time. You can say, I want to block access to Facebook and any of those other social media things that I'm doing for the next two hours because I have to write this paper and you turn it on and it doesn't let you go there. 
So um, I have students that now will religiously do that just because it's easier for them because they don't really think, oh, they just think, oh, I'm just going to go over here and check this real quick and 20 minutes later <laughs> they get back. So if they use that, then it's just that constant reminder because they try to go somewhere and it's like, oh, I blocked that. Okay, back to my paper. <laughs> So those are my favorites in terms of extensions for accessibility, but there are tons of them out there. If you go to the Chrome Web Store, you can actually sort it by topic, and uh, there's a category menu, and if you go to uh, accessibility topics and then view all, you'll see all the ones related to accessibility. So it, it's pretty immense how many are out there. So yeah, here's the all menu, pull down to accessibility, and then view all over here. So these are all things that are related to accessibility. I always give my students a tool that allows them to capture their work, okay? So if they're in class, they write something digitally, there's notes on the board, whatever, they have a way to capture those <laughs> and take them with them. So the one, my go-to is Cam Scanner. Does anybody use Cam Scanner? Uh, Cam Scanner is a free app and you can use it on any smartphone. Uh, what it does is allows you to take a picture of text and then it makes it look like the actual paper that it was on, okay? So it's kind of like having that original. So if I took a picture of a document, um, it allows you to crop or rotate it. it you can you know, pick the portion that you want so this is what it looks like on the camera. Uh, you're actually using their camera within the app. Then you can fix it. You can say how you want it to look and verify it. There's also OCR rec text recognition built into it if you want that. And then um, when you're done with it, you can share it to your Google Drive, which is what I typically do. Um, a lot of people will email things directly to somebody from there. So when you get it done and it's a PDF, you can send it out however you want, basically, to, to any of those locations. So you can add a page to it. If I have a document that's you know 10 pages long and I want to make a digital copy of it, I just add page, click, add page, click, and then I've got the whole document in there. I show this to K-12 teachers and they create digital portfolios for their students this way because you want to be able to send that piece of work home that the, t the student did so their parents can keep it, but at the same time you don't know if it's ever going to get there. <laughs> and if you take a little picture of it, um, then you, you've got it for forever. And, and so I have a lot of K-12 teachers that do that. But for uh, students in our uh, higher ed classes, this is priceless for them to just to be able to capture things. Um, I also utilize it in my classes specifically because I don't allow them to turn anything into me on paper. They have the option to do it on paper if they want to, but they're not allowed to turn it into me on paper. Um, so I say, okay, cam scanner, take a picture, upload it to BB Learn. And, and that's how I deal with things. Um, so very popular one. Now this one is fun to use. I don't know if you've ever used either one of these. These are actually developed for the blind and they're free apps, both of them. Uh, the one for iOS is Seeing AI and that's the one that I have access to that I'll show you and pass around. Um, the one for Android is called Speak. And the way that they work, they actually have a lot of capabilities that don't really apply to everyone, right? So for the blind, for instance, they can uh, direct it at a piece of money and it will tell them if it's a $5 bill or if it's a quarter or whatever. Um, it, it can tell them things like that. It can read a barcode at a grocery store and tell them what food they're, they're buying, uh, those kinds of things. But the simple part that anybody can use is if you direct it at a piece of paper with print on it, it will read it to you just by pointing it at it. Um, now I use this because I'm getting old and I have to do this a lot, <laughs> right? <laughs> so instead of doing this, I just pull it up on my phone and go like this and it will read it to me. I run into that a lot with technology because sometimes I have to get like um, numbers off the back of a device 
and I can't read things that are that small, even if I have glasses on. <laughs> so my phone can. <laughs> uh, so that, that's a great way to use it. But um, e both of these are free. So whether you're iOS or Android, and I'll pass around and you can play with it a little bit. Um, let's see. Oh, no. Seeing AI. I should have remembered to pull this up at the beginning. Short text. So you can do short text or you can um, take a picture of a document and then actually save that and have it read to you later. This gets used a lot in the K-12 classroom for students who don't necessarily need to be read to, but sometimes it's just a little easier and it gives them an opportunity to listen. Zero eight. Document. Let that not visible. And then I also have it on my phone for Android. So on there it is called Speak It. And again, these are linked. So if you go there and click, uh, you'll get the link that goes directly to it. Speak, um, it's called Speak, actually. Yeah, Speak, and it's from High Mountain. Because there's about 10 different Speak apps. When you type in Speak to Android, it's high, hard to find. But if you type in Speak High Mountain, um, it usually comes up right away. On my iPhone, VR content sources. <laughs> So I'm trying to think, what do I have that we can find it at? Uh, you can try the back of your bag, and it can read uh, the schedule to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I meant to bring like one of those little tiny soap bottles from the hotel, and then I could just you know show you how I use it because I can't possibly read the contents on things. <laughs> And the lovely thing about it, I mean, is it's made for a blind person. So they have it set up so all you do is put, you know, just direct it at the piece of paper and it's there. It just does it automatically. Um, so I think that one, it, it helps. I've, I've been doing a study with blind students too and it's proving to help them be more independent in the classroom. Uh, another one I use all the time, Doc Hub. I show my students Doc Hub. My students get stuff all the time, believe it or not, at universities. We still make them do so much stuff on paper. Why do we do that? Um, <laughs> they get documents all the time that they have to sign off on, right? Or it's a PDF and they need to actually add text to it. And they don't know how to do that. Doc Hub lets you do all of that. Anybody use Doc Hub? So Doc Hub is free. And if you go out to it, it's also crossed over with your Google account. So if you have a PDF in Google, you can right click on it and open it with Doc Hub. So it makes it a little bit faster. Um, there is a, uh, you can access it from the Chrome Web Store as well. But I am going to go to the website so that I can show you how it works real quick. I use it pretty much to sign everything. When I moved to Idaho, I signed every single paper for buying a house, which is like, what, a hundred of them, in Doc Hub, because it just made life easy. I promise it will load, there you go. So you can sign in with your um, Google account, and then it will cross right over, which is nice. But here's what it looks like. If I have, let's see, I'll go to this one. I don't remember what this was. Oh, this is for one of my robots. Okay, so uh, I had to fill out a bid, bid waiver for the university, every, everything at the university paper. Um, <laughs> and they needed me to fill this out. And I was like, okay, I'll fill it out. And so, so all I do is I upload things to .pub and you've got up here a text box. You can drop that text box anywhere on the page and start typing. Okay, and if you want it to match the text that's on the page, what I do is I come down and I copy a piece of that text in the PDF 
and then I paste it in that box, and then I can rewrite over it and have the same font, <laughs> okay? So it, it, it will work that way, but you can line up the lines and everything. Um, <clears throat> you can see down here I had to sign it, so how do you sign things in here? When you go to sign, if you want to go create your signature, because it needs a signature first, you can either go with your phone and grab the, the URL, or I'm sorry, the, what are those little codes called? QR codes, thank you. Um, <laughs> so by phone, you can do it that way. You can also just put your phone number in, and it sends you text. There's my text and I open it on here and it will tell me to sign. So basically it says rotate your device to landscape then sign your signature. I hit OK, I rotate it and I sign it with my finger or a little stylus if I have one handy. <laughs> and then uh, when I hit OK on there it will load over here. I just probably have to reload the page. And then after I go to sign something, I can come down here and grab my signature. And then I can put my signature wherever I want and make it bigger or smaller. Okay. Um, I also have my husband's signature saved and my son's signature because a lot of times I need them to sign off on things. And if I leave it for them, they'll forget to do it. And sometimes it's just not, you know, not convenient. So my husband knows I have it. Uh, the other thing you can do then when you're ready for your PD, you're done and you've completed it, if you go over here, you can send it directly to somebody. You can download it to um, your computer. You can send it to Google Drive. You know, wherever you want to keep it, you can print it from here if you need to. So you've got all kinds of options on what you do with it. Uh, you also can, if you ever get a document, and I tell you this because the university makes me fill out this document every year that... Um, if I take a course, then I have to fill out this document so that they'll pay for the course, right? Well, it's got this thing down the side of it where I have to put my name in. So what I do is I fill out part of the document, I download it, I re-upload it to DocHub, I flip it, and then I fill in the other portion. <laughs> and then I download it again, pull it up, flip it, <laughs> and send it back to them. So you, you can do things like that too. You can rotate a document in here if you need to. Um, Reordify, anybody use that? So this is a favorite with my students and it's not because it reads to them. Um, so let me, let me show you though. They, they do like the fact that it, it, it doesn't read to you but it simplifies text. Okay, so um, you take a piece of difficult text and simplify it. And I will use that NPR article again, which is right here. So I'm just going to take the URL and copy it. And I'm going to paste it into Rewordify. And I can either pull the text into Rewordify and Rewordify it there, or I can Rewordify the entire website. Okay, so I'll show you what both look like. If I re rewordify the website, it's pushing that, the tool out to the website, and you will see that if there is a difficult word, it will rewordify it. Okay, now this is set at a lower level, so this is rewordifying the words astronaut okay, to space travelers. The other thing that it does is that when it rewordifies something, it doesn't change the context of the sentence. So the student can literally just keep reading and not worry about, oh, this means this, and have to try to fit that in the sentence. It always fits in the context of the sentence. So the way it is in this mode is you highlight, or you, I'm sorry, hover over the highlighted words and you'll see what was there originally what the original text said. However, if you pull it in to rewordify instead, it, it gives you more flexibility. So let me show you that. If I go back here and I say, okay, I want to rewordify the web page text only. Now it's pulling the text in to rewordify. And I'll hit rewordify text there. Oh, that's my Google dictionary kicking in. You saw that. <laughs> um, so here we go. Uh, and 
it looks the same, but if I go up here into the corner and click on settings, then I can mess with it. So maybe I don't like to see it, that I have to hover to see the original text. You could do something like this where it shows you both. It has the original in, um, right there and then the um, rewordified version in parentheses next to it. Um, you could also just do it where it does the opposite and it leaves the re original words there and it, you can just hover if you need it rewordified. Okay, um, you could do two columns, or you could do where it will actually define the words to the right for you. Okay, so there's lots of different options. You can also change the color combinations down at the bottom. So I don't like yellow and purple together. They just don't work for me. So I'd probably choose red and green or something like that. Some students colorblind. They can underline it instead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> there's always options, right? Because we think about that accessibility piece. Here is where you can change the reading level. So if I know it rewordified astronauts, I probably could knock it down a little bit um, and change it to level two or something like that. Uh, so you can mess with levels a little bit too. So if I save that, then it's going to save uh, the way I want it to look. And now that's what it looks like out here. Okay. So however you make your settings is uh, what, will, what will pop up on that main page then. Now, here's the other part that's built in that my students love. Uh, lots of times students have tr more trouble writing than they do reading, okay? And when they write, they question their own writing. So there is a stats feature in here, and I show this to all of my students. And what it does is it gives a readability score of the text that you put in there. So they can take their writing and plug it into Rewordify and see what level they are writing at. So what is the readability level of their writing? <laughs> and my students really like this. The other thing that they like about it is it breaks down the statistics on it. It'll show them the total word count, the average sentence length. Um, it gives them syllable counts. And then you can actually pull up a data table that will break things down farther for them, okay? Uh, when I deal with this in the K-12 classroom, I show teachers different features. And those might be things like the print and learning activities because we know that research shows that it, when you teach vocabulary, you should only teach it in context. You shouldn't just be pulling out random vocabulary words that they'll remember for a day and then they forget forever. Um, <laughs> so it generates these automatically. So this is an article I wanted them to read in class. It's pulling the vocabulary out for me because those are the words that rewordify. And now I can go over here and I can say, oh, I want a matching activity with those words and hit print and there it is. So it does that all automatically. You can do um, fill in the blank, matching, you can do um, multiple choice, all those types of things. Um, and they're just generated for you. You just have to click the button. The other thing I show K-12 teachers is the parts of speech function. Um, as a former English teacher, this is my most horrible thing to have to teach. Um, you can go in here and turn off everything else and say, okay, well, we're talking about verbs and how when you write, your verbs are kind of weak. Okay, <laughs> so now it's only showing me the verbs on the page and the students can go down through and look specifically at their verbs and say, okay, well, you know, do you have a lot of action verbs in here? So when you're writing, can you put verbs in that, you know, do a little more for the writing? Um, so you can talk to them about things like that. Uh, it, other, it has a, another level that some of my students use. So classic lit is up here. So if you want to read any of the classics or you have to read a classic and you're struggling with it because it's written so long ago that it's like a foreign language to you, uh, they're all rewordified in here. <laughs> Every Shakespeare play is rewordified by act. <laughs> so you can go in and, and have that. Um, the other thing that's rewordified automatically is um, public documents. So I can go into the public documents and I can look at the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or any of the old documents that had old language in them. And, and get a you know modernized version basically. Um, so those things are, are available as well. Oh, 
Okay. Um, I also show my students that um, I have a lot of students that prefer to use Google uh, versus Microsoft. And they have a lot of good reasons for that, which I'll talk to in length after this. But um, a lot of it has to do with the fact when they come from K-12, that's what their experience was. They were used to using Google Docs. Most K-12 schools have sort of embraced the Google world. And so they want to be able to collaborate in a document. They want to be able to do things the way that they were used to. They want to not have to click save every time that they, you know, type something in a document. So um, I show them that in Google Drive, because a lot of them, even though they've been using Google Docs, don't know that they can use it offline, right? So you can go to Google Drive, go to the settings and click use offline. And on that particular device, anytime you're on it, you can pull up a document, type into it just like you normally would. And the next time you hit Wi-Fi, it will update the document automatically. So that's really, really important for students, especially student athletes that travel a lot. They're stuck on a bus for a long time. They're stuck on a plane. Uh, they don't have internet access. You know, that's, that's a really easy way for them to still be able to get their work done. Um, I also show all of my students how to do <laughs> voice typing in Google. Do any of you voice type? Yeah, so I, I hate to write, absolutely hate to. Um, I have to because, you know, you have to have those publications with what you do for work. But um, <laughs> I, I voice type almost everything that I write. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the end product of it. It just means I'm getting my ideas down on paper. Um, and honestly, that's what students have the most trouble with. They have trouble getting it from here onto something without losing track of what their thought process was. But if they can voice type, then so much easier. Uh, so if you're not using voice typing, you can actually do punctuation as well. And we'll see if it'll let me do it on here. I'll go out and create a Google Doc. There we go. So voice typing is under your tools menu. And if you click tools and pull down the voice typing, it will say uh, that it needs to access um, your speaker after you click. And if you say allow, then it should start picking up your words. Period. So you can actually put punctuation on it, indent, New paragraph, Ooh, it, it popped up options for me to indent. New paragraph, hello, oh, I do. New paragraph, hello, question mark. So it, it picks things up pretty well. Um, as long as you're not in a noisy room or you, you know, are close enough to your device. Uh, I even do it on my phone sometimes. So <laughs> voice typing is sort of priceless. And then when you're done with it, of course, you can go back through and fix anything that you need to and edit it up. But um, if you learn how to use the uh, voice commands, you can almost do ev all of it with voice typing because you can uh, capitalize things, whatever. I also, in the um, presentation, I linked the guide for voice commands. There we go. So there's the guide and it takes you out to a Google support page that gives you a cheat sheet for typing with your voice. And here is how you add punctuation, for instance. You can just say period, comma, exclamation point. It will pick all of those up. Uh, new line, new paragraph. You can also use your voice to select text. <laughs> so you can say select all and change the font if you want to. Um, you can use voice to edit your document. So when we talk about accessibility, and I have students that have uh, poor motor skills and really need stuff like this, uh, they can almost do it all for free in Google Voice Typing. So the other G Suite tools, I always love to throw these in because I think there are specific features within them that make accessibility really awesome for students. 
Um, docs, obviously, the feedback piece. As a, as a teacher, if I can give them feedback on their writing where the, the text is right there connected to it, if I do that in Google Docs, it's so easy. I can see what they're doing live. I just have them give me the hyperlink to their document and make sure that their shared settings are so that I can edit or I can um, at least comment, <laughs> okay? Uh, so that's that feature. Um, sheets, I show them the, the capabilities of using sheets for data that they capture. A lot of students aren't familiar if they didn't take a business class in high, high school, they're, they're not very good at using Excel. And uh, Google Docs is a little bit more simplified. So I have students that are very comfortable with that. Uh, slides. One of my favorite features in slides that most people don't know about, and we'll see if you guys knew about this. When you go to presentation mode, if you hover down at the bottom, these tools pop up. Okay? So I... And it goes away if you don't stay there. There we go. So I have a pointer built into here, and I can use the pointer with my mouse. Okay. Um, I can also do closed captions. I can do my notes. But here's a feature that I show faculty all the time. It's called Q&A. Okay. And I have this set up specifically so that you can see what I'm doing. If you were doing this in a classroom, you would have it set up so that they're seeing, they're not seeing your teacher notes, your presentation mode. You, only you would be seeing this, okay? But when it pops up, if you say start new, it pops up a Google link. So it's slides.apps. Uh, .goo.gl slash whatever code it sticks at the end. And once a student puts this in, they can um, ask questions during your presentation. <laughs> and then as the questions come up, you can kind of field them. And if you don't have time for them, at the end of class, you've got a record of all the questions that were asked. And you can go back and say, okay, well, I need to get to these things when we have class again on Thursday. Yeah? So if you're not actively presenting, Still use that to see if people had questions about, like if you just had a slide presentation up. Right. I think you have to be actively presenting because you have to turn it on. Okay. So what I'm wondering though is if I turned it on and just left it on, yeah. then when I went back to it, I would probably just be able to capture that then, right? Because I haven't turned it off. So as long as I left it on, then it should should show me all that stuff. So it'd be interesting to try that out, yeah? Um, so I had a, uh, I did a presentation early in the semester this year and they asked me to go over stuff for dual credit teachers. And it wasn't just the dual credit teachers, it was also our faculty that partner with them in the classroom at the same time. And they were all learning about different tools to use for teaching and learning. Uh, this was one of the features I showed them. <laughs> one of the faculty members went home, told her husband about some of these, and he has been using this like crazy in a biology, like an upper level class that he teaches, and the students absolutely love it. Because now they don't have to feel embarrassed to ask a question, first of all, and that's a huge thing during, especially in higher ed. Uh, students are afraid to ask questions often. So he's now getting all of these questions that he never got before when he was presenting the material. Is it anonymous? Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, and you can upvote other people's questions too. So if you have the same question, you already see it in there, you just upvote it. So sometimes he'll see one and it's like, oh, well, five people didn't understand that, so I'm going to have to cover that one again, right? So just a lot of power to it. And this is why I always tell people, my faculty, about Google versus Microsoft. It's just, it has these little things built into it that make my life a little bit easier. And that's why I tend to use it more often. Okay. Um, Google Forms, I use probably daily. <laughs> uh, if a student walks in class, I use Google Forms to take attendance. Uh, so when they come in, they'll have a question that they have to answer, and it was about what we did last time. And that's often their points, their participation points that day, because I know they're there, right? Um, 
I use it for other things too. I use it for quick quizzes, you know, um, surveys, if I want to find out some information for them. I often use it when they have an activity that they're doing in groups. And I'll say, okay, this is a three, two, one. And the first thing your group needs to do is write down three things that you found in that article that really jumped out at you. Then write down two questions that you have about that topic that we're talking about. And then write down one thing that, you know, whatever. So, but I give them it to them on Google Forms. When my students are working in groups, they can be filling it out. I can go to Forms Live in the background and see how many of my groups are done, <laughs> um, what the sheet looks like, right? What their answers are. Um, and then I can pull that up in front of the whole class and say, okay, well, you all said these 15 things were the most important things from the article because each group had to pick three and there were five groups in the room, right? So it's very easy to sh uh, field that sort of data in, in Forms. So anytime you're in a Google Form, how many of you use Google Forms? Okay, yeah, when you're in a Google Form and you translate it over to Sheets, there's wonderful things that can happen. The other thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is when you're in a form, let's, oh, that's my food safety one, I didn't want that one, I wanted my, oh. nutrition. Do do. Aha, we'll go to e potato. So, <clears throat> no, that's not showing me forms. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble finding the one that I want. You can see that I use Google Forms a lot, right? These are all mine. <laughs> I use it for exit tickets a lot too when students are about to leave and I think, oh, okay, well, what, what didn't they get? What do I need to follow up on next time? Um, okay, protein survey. I'm going to go to this one. So when you go to your responses tab, everything's sort of broken down there by summary responses or individual responses, and it actually gives you um, pictures to go with that data, right? So that you know how many people answered a certain thing just by looking at that caption of the picture. So when I use this in class, I'll pull these things up for students and say, oh, well look, so many people said this thing, and that was like the most popular answer. Let's talk about that, right? The other thing it does is you can view your responses in sheets. Um, and when you do this, if you do it strategically enough, uh, if you have one class and you're using forms a lot, you can actually load all of your forms to the same sheet. When you click that option, it will say, do you wanna create a new sheet or send this to an old sheet? If you send it to an old sheet, it'll just create a new tab for you at the bottom of the sheet. So I can have like 50 forms feed in to one sheet. <laughs> and if I wanna see my, my data for students, I can then just click to the different ones, okay? So here's my protein survey again. If I go up here and I wanna see that data chart the way it was on the responses tab, I can go down here into the co corner and there's a button called the explore button. And if you click on explore, it will pop up those charts over here. Okay, and then you can actually take those charts, make them full screen, you can capture the pictures of them, whatever you need to do. So I have a lot of people that use this to track data for their classes, um, especially in the K-12 world where they have to track data, you know, and they have to keep that in some way. This is a really easy way for them to do it, um, uh, especially with special needs students. So those are some things about forms that I absolutely love, and again, Google's got that for me, but there's nothing like it in the Microsoft world. So, you know, it, it wins me over sometimes. Um, Google Drawings. I show my students those because I have a lot of students who will be in a class where they ask them to make some kind of chart, and then they tell them, oh, well, here's a series of tools you might try to use, but they're all so far over their heads that they have no clue how to use them. Uh, Google Drawing is probably the easiest tool in the world for a student to make a chart with. Okay, so I had to make a chart with one of my classes last week. 
I'm sure I can find it. It's actually for a certificate that I'm getting online. So if I go down here and find drawings, I'm sure it will pop up right at the top because I just made it. Oh, let's see. I'm getting their strategy cards first. Do, do, do. Hmm. Oh, here it is. What is create? So it was on a uh, Creative Commons. So I'm getting a license on Creative Commons, right? So they wanted to, us to make some kind of flow chart that explained Creative Commons. I was like, ah, Google Draw. <laughs> so Google Drawing is just one of those. So it's so easy for me to learn to use. I don't have to try to figure anything out. It's not above my head. I had a student come in last week, and another faculty member had asked him to um, make. He was doing a presentation. And she asked him to make handouts of these tools and how to use them, right? And, and she gave him a couple ideas of different tools he could use. And just like I said, the tools were completely, it would, have, it would have taken him five hours to build a chart in one of these tools. And so he came in for 10 minutes. <laughs> I said, here's how Google Draw works. And I showed him all the tools and he was like, that is so much easier. <laughs> because he didn't have to do anything difficult. He just needed to have little talking bubbles and be able to throw pictures in and change the background. And you can do all of that in, in Google Drawing. Okay, so it's one of those um, lesser used Google tools that we tend to forget about, but uh, comes in handy for me. Another one I like to show people is Maps. So Google Maps has a build your own map function. So if you ever use My Maps, if you ever need to build a map for anything, it's awesome. Uh, one of my um, assignments in my teaching and learning with technology course that I teach to future teachers is for them to build a Google Map. And it's just so they see the flexibility of using a tool that they wouldn't think, oh, I could use a Google Map for when I'm teaching English. I could use a Google map related to when I'm teaching agricultural education. Um, and they come up with the best ideas on these maps that they make, and, and it's phenomenal. It's always their favorite assignment during the course, um, and, and that's pretty much across the board for whatever subject area they are. Uh, so a couple examples, um, I have a student who one year, this was probably one of my favorites, um, she was teaching, she was going to be a math teacher, and she wanted to teach the Pythagorean theorem and do it through Google Maps. And so she chose our ice cream parlors in Sandpoint, Idaho. And the students had to uh, get the three ice cream parlors on the map, and then they had to figure out the Pythagorean theorem based on the three locations. Um, so, I mean, she built an entire lesson in Google Maps that way. Uh, Google Maps will allow you to drop pins. You can put text on the pins. You can put hyperlinks in the pins so you can go out to other information. You can add slideshows of pictures and video that go with the pin points on your map. Uh, so there's so much there's so much level to it that uh, really, really priceless. So if you've never built your own map, uh, the way that you get to it is uh, if you just go into Maps, of course you have to be logged into your Google account. But My Maps is located um, under that menu on the left hand side. So where you see the three bars, if you click there, you pull down to Your Places, and then you go to Maps. And so here are all of My Maps. I've got lots of them. Um, I can show you an example. So here was, um, I teach a course every year for international teaching assistants. And the first day of class, I pull up a map that shows where everybody lives. And so they get a real quick caption of, we represent all of these countries in this class right now. Uh, they can also then click on a place and see what student that is and what they're studying so that they can make connections with other students in the classroom that either have similar majors or maybe are some from the same country and they've just never met. Um, so that's just one really easy example. The way you create your own Google Map though is you go to the bottom and just click Create Map and then it brings up all the tools and you can kind of do whatever you need with it. Okay, close a couple things. There we go. <laughs> um, has anybody ever used Jamboard? 
so Google Jamboard actually does work. Um, Google Jamboard is a Google product that also has hardware. Okay, but all the Jamboard app is is a whiteboard. So you can go into Google and pull up a whiteboard in Jamboard. So if I go new, more, and find Google Jamboard, um, now I've got a virtual whiteboard on my screen and I can do whatever I want to it. Okay, I can stick text on it, I can write on it, whatever I need to do. So I have students that will use this for different presentation stuff. And then of course it's shareable, it's um, collaborative, they can do this together. Uh, so it just gives it kind of another creative option within the Google Suite. And even though you had to pay for the hardware if you were to use the actual board in your classroom, the software is free and it'll work in any of the Google tools. So if you're only ever looking to use it there, you don't need the hardware at all to interact with it. So. And then the last one I have on there is Google Keep. Um, I keep everything in Google Keep. I think students need to know that there is a place that's easy access for them to just throw stuff when they find it, okay? So when students are doing research, for instance, they can put uh, Google Keep as a Chrome extension and they can click on Send to Keep, it's called. And if they click the extension, the article gets shot to their Keep account. Okay, so lots of just really easy interactions there. Um, Keep allows you to take notes, make lists. Uh, you can attach a website, you can attach a picture. If you have a device that you can write on, you can draw within Google Keep and take written notes instead. So I have a lot of students that do that, that they prefer that. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of showing them the, the possibilities that exist there. And then the last thing that I show them is voice memos. <laughs> I think a lot of times we wanna capture what somebody says and we don't know the easy way to do that. Um, so if you don't know this on your smartphone, this one's actually built in for voice memos. Uh, it's, it's an app that comes on, on your, um, I'm sorry, on your iPhone, okay? Uh, so I, I linked, oh, whoops. I guess I didn't link the right one. So there's one that comes on your iPhone though. It's, I believe it's called Voice Recorder. Um, but this is an article about how to use voice memos on iPhone. So it will show you how to pull it up and where it lives. But it's, it's one of those things that iPhone, it it's automatically lives there and you can't delete it. It's one of those, <laughs> okay? Um, if you're an Android user, then I would suggest you upload um, one called Voice Recorder. This is the one I use. So if I'm interviewing for a research project, I interview on Voice Recorder. I get back, I download it, and I wipe it off my phone, right? So that's just my real quick way to uh, capture that. Um, so I show this to students because they have a lot of situations where they'd like to be able to record something, but they don't know how easy it is. They tend to not use their phones enough if you don't show them that they can be very purposeful <laughs> in how they use it, right? And that, um, so in my classroom, my, my students probably have to use their phone at least three times a period, at least. There's always something I'm saying, hey, answer this real quick for me. And then I'm popping up, oh, this is, this is what everybody thinks, you know? So there, there's always that interaction piece going on. So questions. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit removed from it at this point. Mm -hmm. I've lived in that world. Everybody is anti-phone. Do you see that starting to change? Yeah, actually I saw that starting to change about five years ago. And I think the reason was that um, teachers started to realize how much power they had with just little things like, oh, I can use Kahoot in my classroom. Um, so K-12 teachers love uh, digital assessment. <laughs> and Kahoot is so much fun for students because it challenges them. They're playing against each other. And they can use their phones for it. So what I see most K-12 schools now do is that they have a policy that says it's up to the teacher's discretion. And so if a teacher is willing to say, yeah, we're going to use phones in my class because I have these purposeful ways that we're using them. And then they just have rules that you have your phone out while we're doing this stuff and you have it away the rest of the time. 
Um, I think students really like that perspective because then they feel like they're being treated m more maturely in a way. Um, schools where they try to lock them down is where I see the most frustration and the most um, people wanting to violate it, right? <laughs> if you tell them they can't do 